these social media conversations, uh, the August uh, protests, uh, as uh, you know, foretold, eventually went ahead yesterday uh, with some quite tragic outcomes in some centers across the country. Of course, there were push and pull between the protesters and law enforcement agents in some areas uh, that uh, perhaps such uh, um, you know, interactions, or, so to speak, were not expected. Um, the call for improved conditions uh, for Nigerians uh, also now eventually when it got to the streets, uh, threats to life and livelihood. Uh, we had reports about that uh, in the course of our broadcast yesterday. My name is Fisai Ogunfuyi. Welcome to NTA's live broadcast, a special broadcast, still focusing on this August protests uh, by Ni Nigerian citizens and uh, the interaction with government, as well as uh, what uh, will come up again today. We will keep our, eye, our eyes and our cameras and lenses uh, all over the country to find out exactly what is happening and we'll be giving you updates as well from the studios and getting insights and analysis from those who should know and perhaps also some of those who participated in the activities yesterday uh, of course uh, we would also be speaking to people in government uh, in terms of their reactions and uh, perhaps also the uh, part of protesters to see the timelines whether they have shifted and perhaps if they have shifted ground as well in terms of some of the demands being made let me quickly welcome a guest into the studio. Uh, David Akoji is the Director of Special Duties uh, State Operations of the National Orientation Agency. Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to be here, Fisayo. I, Good morning, uh, listeners. And it's Mr. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you were quite busy yesterday. Very. <laughs> uh, let's also, also welcome uh, via Zoom Dr. Philip Ayer, Research Fellow, National Institute of Conflict Resolution. Uh, that is quite topical at this time. Uh, Dr. Philip Hayep, if you're there, uh, welcome to this special broadcast uh, on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. Good morning and thank you for having me. Okay, let's start from you, uh, Dr. Hayep, uh, because of your background in conflict resolution. You've seen day one of the protest. You've seen what uh, transpired. In some places where we expected uh, those places to be flashpoints, the citizens were quite orderly. The interaction with law enforcement agents were cordial. Uh, in some places where not much of this was anticipated, we saw an inferno in terms of uh, the reaction of citizens and perhaps even uh, outlaws who perhaps uh, took over the situation and then uh, it ran out of uh, control, uh, leading to loss of lives. In some places, uh, you know, the statistics uh, uh, ruled out in some quarters up to almost 17 lives uh, in the course of what happened yesterday. So, first of all, your first intervention in what, into what happened yesterday and perhaps your overall view of uh, what to expect, uh, you know, today based on some of the things you saw yesterday. Well, thank you. Um... What happened yesterday is uh, unfortunate, particularly in uh, some parts of Nigeria, namely Kano uh, and even Kaduna, the state that I come from, and then also flashes of, uh, you know, um, unfortunate incidences in areas of Abu, maybe neighboring, neighboring uh, community to Abuja, like um, um, like um like karu nya nya um for instance i live in a compound here where a name it seems to have lost you we'll try to uh re-establish contact uh, with uh, dr philip hayep a research fellow national institute for okay i think your audio is coming back went please go ahead when he went to pick up this child, they were not just attacked, but their car was smashed. Um, you can imagine having a newborn child with celebration and then coming home uh, scared. So that is actually unfortunate. And um, we now see that in some of the places, the protest was not just about, to my mind, might not just be about the hardship the country, but also maybe... Uh, certain individuals, uh, maybe the protesters, I mean, might have uh, personal grievances uh, and the opportunity of using the platform of the protest against hardship in the country to 
Yeah, and in most cases, it's, also, it's always a misplaced um, ventilation of anger. So this is unfortunate. Yes, protest is democratic. Protest is um, pro uh, accepted by the, or is, or is enshrined in the constitution. But destruction of any property, whether of government or of individuals, is not um, the way out, is not the way forward. If we are saying that uh, we are protesting against hardship and then we destroy property uh, worth billions, if not, uh, millions, if not billions of Naira, it is, it, it, it is sort of a setback. Uh, I was watching a video shortly before the session and in Kano of young people uh, mounting the traffic lights and they were beating it up or tried to break it down uh, to, to pull it off from the stands. Now, traffic light supports uh, safety for travelers and uh, it supports safety for even the pedestrians. So, All right, uh, it seems as if uh, we're having some challenges with uh, the connection with Dr. Philip Haye. But, Dr., I mean, Mr. David Akuji is right here, Director of Special Duties, uh, State Operations and National Orientation Agencies, uh, Agency. We, you know, Nigerians who watch at home some of the uh, things that transpired yesterday were taken aback by some pictures uh, in some parts of the North, especially in terms of uh, the sheer, uh, you know, brigandage is seen in some places where they gain the entrance into government facilities. Some facilities are not, are not even been commissioned, you know, and then destroying those, uh, you know, facilities. Uh, what would be your comments at this time? And uh, how are we, you know, trying to, you know, manage this situation in terms of advocacy as well? Okay, you see, it's unfortunate some of the things that um, happened yesterday in the course of this protest. A lot of them were predictable um, outcomes. Uh, based on experience in the past, you know, around protests. And National Orientation Agency, we had highlighted this fact. I think one key lesson to draw from the things that we saw yesterday on the part of the promoters of this protest is the fact that, um, you see, in periods of social tensions, such as what we have that led to this protest, you find that the proponents of protest tend to listen more to their leaders, those who are calling for the protest, than they listen to government. So what is the lesson to learn here? I think that there is a need for a lot of advocacy on the parts of the leaders of this protest to those who subscribe to their ideals, you know, on how to conduct themselves during times of protest such as this. And this is extremely important, Fisayo, you know. Um, because at times like this, when there's heightened social tensions, people tend to listen more to the promoters of protests. Those promoters of protests should engage. They should advocate. They should talk to their people about what the law says about legitimate protests. Yes, the law says people have the right to protest. This is encapsulated in Section 39 you know, of the Constitution. But then that law should not now impede you understand? The right to protest should not now impede on the right to... All right, all right, all right, Mr. David, just to, just to get, you know, uh, perspective, especially this morning, because yes. we are recalling what happened yesterday. But in terms of what has happened this morning, mm -hmm. one of the designated areas uh, uh, for the protest is the National Stadium, Moshudabiola National Stadium here in Abuja. Our correspondent, uh, Joseph Osen, has been there uh, since morning, is still there. Joseph, perhaps uh, you would probably be in the best uh, position to tell us what is happening right there now. Are the uh, protesters converging or what is the situation there uh, at the Moshud Abiola National Stadium? Okay, Fisayo, um, here at the Moshud Abiola uh, Stadium, where I'm standing actually, you will not really have a true picture of it because of uh, it's a bit drizzling, so I had to take cover. But what we had earlier on is that we had a sec uh, security beefing up. We have security on ground and um, some uh, reporters also who came around and uh, we have, uh, have uh, quite a number of them. Then minutes ago, we had about 15, 15 in number from fa uh, familiar faces from those who protested yesterday converging. And then I spoke with one of them who told me that they are actually gathering, their group members are gathering at a, a beggar junction 
to move uh, to this place. And then after a while, they now moved again to go and join them there at Bega. Okay, so um, are they uh, planning to return uh, to the National Stadium or are they proceeding from Bega? Do you have that information uh, or, uh, you know, taking on, uh, on board this other question, it looks a little bit deserted. It seems as if, uh, apart from those who, uh, you know, were part of it yesterday, no new uh, groups are coming to the uh, National Stadium. No, no new group is coming. The faces I've seen here so far, 15 in number, uh, that's the building now. I can still see um, about five of them there now who just came in. So that's uh, uh, approximately about 20 in number. Who, but they say th those earlier ones who came, who came earlier on have moved now. They say they, they, I saw them boarding to Bega. They said they'll go and join the other group and then move down to the stadium here. Okay, so we would, uh, you know, uh, keep you there so that uh, if they come, we can uh, get a sense of what is happening and then moving forward if uh, what the activities are for day two. Of course, uh, that was a, a point of convergence uh, yesterday, uh, the Moshu Dabiola uh, National Stadium. Thank you very much, Joseph Hossein, for, you know, keeping us... Uh, uh, you know, uh, abreast of issues, I mean, of uh, the situation there at the National Stadium. We'll be back to you in the course of this broadcast. Thank you so much. Now, uh, if uh, we have Dr. Philip Ayeps uh, back on uh, Zoom, hopefully we can, you know, speak to him about uh, a few of the, you know, issues from yesterday. Is, the, is Dr. Philip back on, on Zoom? Yes, I am. Yes, okay. You. you are, you know, sharing with us uh, some of the, you, you know, your, uh, you know, what you saw from yesterday, an analysis of, of what that, uh, you know, means for the populace and uh, the toll it could be, uh, it could have on, uh, you know, our general well-being uh, as a society. Yes. So thank you. Um, yes, as the the guest in the studio had actually mentioned. Uh, protest is not what we say is wrong. It is what we use the protest to, to do. So the organizers, as noted, are the ones who are supposed to drive home or drum home the message that um, this protest is to make a statement. Um, and indeed, people who have been engaged in study in Africa will tell you that over the years, bad governance has been one of the key factors um, that has, and but it is also a succession. It's not something that has happened overnight. So if the organizers will go to, will speak to the uh, to the people they've mobilized to say yes, we want to make a statement, but in making a statement, we are not out to destroy any property, whether that of government or of uh, individuals. Then we would have solved the problems uh, by half. We do believe that uh, the protesters, most of them educated Nigerians. Um, should be able to conduct themselves in such a way that is decorous, in such a way that is in line with modern behavior of protesting and making their voices heard. And for, but anything that would lead to destruction, the loss of lives of uh, precious life of any individual, be that which we we'll want to remember or be associated with a peaceful protest. So for the states where the protest was peaceful, such as Plateau State, Taraba State from reports, you can see that uh, there is an exit of understanding the difference between protesting and uh, destruction, uh, destroying anything. So we commend the citizens of this country who have so um, caution in the protest to continue to do so. And for those who haven't joined to join, we can indeed protest without destroying that which belongs to us after all. After the protesting period, we will still go back to a rebuilding phase, which we do not want to uh, go through that kind of situation. Again. All right, all right, all so, right Dr. Hayep, let's uh, quickly see if we can join our correspondent, Ignatius Nkwo, who is uh, around Eagle Square. He was there yesterday, uh, give us updates all day. Uh, he's resumed there this morning. Ignatius Nkwo, uh, once you are done adjusting your shirt there, just uh, tell us exactly what is happening at the Eagle Square. Yeah, uh, thank you, Fisayo. Yes, uh, here at the Eagle Square, it's, 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 it's actually calm. 
uh, you know, uh, yesterday, by this time, when we came here yesterday, uh, we, we saw that the security officers here, uh, some of them actually too, they were quite anxious and they were really uh, positioned at strategic locations. And we have quite a higher number of them here yesterday. But this morning and at this point in time, this place is very, very quite calm and normal. In fact, it's as if nothing even happened here around here yesterday. You know, from the Unity Fountain down there to, to the Secretariat, the, all the adjoining roads that, that are surrounding this whole area, everything is just very, very calm. And uh, like I did say earlier, uh, we've just feel just a handful of security officers here, unlike what happened yesterday when we have a, a, a high number of them. Now, and then they, 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 I, I did speak with some of uh, some people who came into the secretariat and some of them told me that actually that uh, that there was no obstruction and uh, I, I did speak with one man who was going to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and I asked him finding your way down to this place how difficult was it he said ah that it was not anything difficult that in fact it was as if nothing was happening and there was no disturbance nothing right from the Nakon uh, junction where he came from and some members who saw some people as well too moving around their normal business crossing the the, the, area, the area to other secretariats to the other offices and then we see security personnel to just some of them moving around so all generally the atmosphere here is just very calm even calmer than yesterday all right thank you ignatius i will still just uh, allow you to uh you know stay there and uh, you know give us updates if there are any uh developing issues as well ignatius Sikwa is a correspondent and was there live yesterday, uh, also bringing us, uh, you know, some of the uh, activities, you know, surrounding that uh, particular activity and the push and pull between uh, protesters and, uh, you know, law enforcement agents. Thank you very much, uh, Ignatius. Uh, Mr. Koji, you, you, Abuja, you know, is peculiar, the FCT, uh, when it comes to protests. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we had areas where they were allowed to, you know, converge and all that, and in terms of the discussions before, you know, uh, yesterday. But some of the protesters insisted that uh, they wanted to march. Uh, in this kind of, you know, situation, how do you engage? Well, you see, um, when the protesters, and I'm referring to the known legitimate pro uh, protesters who engaged with government, uh, insisted that they must go on a street march, we knew that some of the things that happened yesterday would be an obvious unintended outcomes. You know, the burnings of private and public properties and the loss of uh, lives, including, including a burning down of police stations, you know, in some places. All of these were predictable outcomes as soon as the protesters insisted that they would go on a street march. Um, we think that given the level of social tension that we're seeing, that the protesters, uh, the leadership of these protesters should be more circumspect and they should advise uh, their people, you know, given the fact that they are intellectual enough to recognize that some of these outcomes uh, usually happen when protest is done uh, by way of street march. Um, the Inspector General of Police had proposed uh, protest in enclosure at the stadium, you know. If that had happened, uh, I think some of the things, and that happened across the country in similar manner, some of the unsavory incidents that we have seen uh, probably wouldn't um, have happened. So we want to advise that um, the point that is necessary to make had been made as at yesterday, and that as at today, the leadership should begin to engage uh, responsible government authorities with um, specific objectives and timelines. Let me come to you and the agency. Mm -hmm. uh, some, you know, uh, conversations uh, that have, you know, been privy to listen to, you know, uh, in the social media and other places, uh, you know, some of them complained of communication with the people between government and the people. Perhaps that they didn't quite understand some of the policies and some of these issues, the need for this tightening of belt that has led to this uncomfortable situation. Uh, that. And uh, some said uh, perhaps not much has been done in terms of the, you know, advocacy, in terms of, you know, uh, some of these new ideas percolating for the people, especially at the grassroots, those who don't even use the social media, to understand why there will be need for the tightening of belt nationwide before 
uh, we get light at the end of the tunnel. And your agency is one of the agencies so you sat saddled with this responsibility. Mm -hmm. Would you say that uh, we've been able to make sure that these new initiatives and these ideas of government to rejig some of our policies and our economic space have percolated, percolated enough for people to have the understanding uh, to engage rather than, you know, in this uh, 11 days of uh, protest, I mean 10 days of protest? Well, the emphasis is on the word enough. Enough is hardly ever enough. Uh, Nigeria is a country of well over 200 million people and the communication landscape has changed tremendously. It's not the way it used to be when perhaps the most effective way uh, was to go around with uh, vehicles mounted with speaker into villages and with cinematic mobile vehicles that show documentaries, you know, on some of these things. Um, the communication landscape has transformed tremendously. You know, at some point in time, it was just NTA. But today you have a plethora of television stations, you know, uh, some of them even on the internet. So uh, our communication strategy must be a mix of the traditional, the new media, and all of that, so that we're able to reach various demographics. And uh, we have been unfolding several communication platforms, you know, targeted at specific population uh, demographics. In recent times, uh, National Orientation Agency has integrated an artificial intelligence uh, component into our website. And if you go to our website today as I speak with you, you will see that. It's called CLEAN. It's a persona that's able to answer questions regarding any government policy or initiative. And as I speak to you, you can go to www.noa.gov.com, uh, uh, .ng, and you will encounter that persona called CLEAN. And you can engage. It's interactive and conversational. Whatever questions you ask it about any aspect of government programs, policies, and activities, you will get the appropriate answer. That's just one. We have realized also that um, the youth demography, who form 70%, over 70% of our population, uh, 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 demography hardly ever want to read. You understand what I'm saying? And that even when you want to give them information concerning government policies, programs, uh, activities that are beneficial to them, you must incentivize it. So we have introduced gamification, you know, as part of the strategies that we use. Today, uh, last week and the week before last, we put um, a government policies, programs, and activities quiz you know, on our gamification platform, and people engaged and were winning airtime while learning about these programs, policies, and activities. That's the way you incentivize the process for the youth to engage with government and to know what policies are being put out that are beneficial to them. The week before last, it was five million naira we put, worth of airtime. This last week, we put another five million, and the engagement was, was quite impressive, you know, uh, from youths. So, and then we have also been communicating in the grassroots. I just came back from Bauchi day before yesterday night, you know, where we engaged with uh, local government chairmen and secretaries of local government. And across the country, my colleagues, state directors, are all on the field. So it is not particularly correct to say that um, we have not done much. But again, no, I'm I just say... Saying about, I'm just talking about what they said. I'm not saying that it's, it's, you know, that is the situation, so that you <laughs> could, you know, put things in perspective. I, I understand. Yes. yes. So that's exactly what I'm doing. We're doing a lot. But again... Uh, I say that the emphasis is on the word enough. enough. All right, talking about enough, uh, some people say enough is enough as far as Kano is concerned in terms of uh, <laughs> uh, the brigandage scene yesterday. Our uh, correspondent is there uh, standing by. We saw juveniles, we saw kids, you know, uh, on the streets yesterday in Kano. Uh, please, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what is happening in Kano this morning? Good morning. Uh, I'm happy you're safe. I can see some trucks behind you as well. Looks like that one belongs to uh, the fire brigade, fire service. Uh, tell us about what is happening, my brother. Good morning. Good morning, Fisayo. Uh, this uh, is the uh, government house junction. Uh, by my right is the government house, and uh, the adjoining streets are linking up uh, parts of the city and uh, the northern end of the town to this place. And uh, yesterday, as you might, might have seen, 
uh, in our report. Uh, uh, this place was uh, the most uh, congested. This was the uh, 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 meeting point. All the protesters converged here to uh, voice out their uh, grievances and uh, the governor listened to them. But uh, despite that, there were uh, concerns or uh, disturbances in many parts of the uh, city, especially uh, along this uh, road from the city down to this place, and uh, uh, destructions and looting uh, took place that prompted the state government to declare a uh, 24 hour curfew. And uh, presently, is, uh, the security personnel, including the police, uh, the military, are uh, still guarding the entrance, and uh, only uh, those on essential services are allowed into the government house and uh, the state refuse management and sanitation board personnel are cleaning the debris because uh, yesterday they came with tones, uh, uh, woods, uh, so there were lots of uh, 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 remnants of death uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, the governor had to come out physically to address uh, them and uh, assure them that uh, uh, the, uh, their message will be delivered to Mr. President, who he assured also is uh, committed to addressing such concerns. And uh, in other parts of the city, uh, the streets are deserted. Uh, everybody, it seems there is compliance. Uh, as we are coming to the office, uh, only security personnel uh, manning check, checking points and ensuring that only those on essential services are moving around and uh, they, 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 they also make sure that anyone that is uh, without any cordial reason of coming out is turned back. So, so far so good, the city is calm and uh, everybody, most people are indoors, uh, all the uh, security personnel and uh, workers on uh, essential duties. Okay, Abdullahi, um, I'm happy that I can still see some street lights behind you. Uh, with some pictures that we saw from yesterday, the level of vandalism, especially in terms of uh, you know infrastructure, was quite uh, disturbing. Uh, looking at uh, those who you know participated in you know that day of rage in Kano yesterday, uh, if you spoke to any of the younger generation in you know your state, do, did they even? have an understanding of what, you know, the protest was about uh, in terms of, you know, the agitations, why they would, you know, uh, target some of the infrastructure that it's meant for them. Uh, I just want to try and get a sense of what informed, uh, you know, such a display. Uh, this question you are asking was asked even before the day of the protest. Stakeholders during the uh, with the state governor like Emir Mohamed Sanusi and some uh, scholars were asking who, are, who asked them to protest and if they are protesting, what is, how are they going to go about it? And uh, yesterday I happened to talk uh, privately with uh, some young protesters. Why are they doing that? They said this is the only way they will send their message to the government. That's the, the, the only way it will be heard. Because uh, they were saying they, to their belief, is uh, vandalizing properties is like they are vandalizing the governor's or president's property. So there is lack of uh, awareness uh, on the side of this younger generation. So that was even the reason why the governor, the emir, and uh, the elders were asking the organizers not to embark, to discontinue with the uh, process because it may be uh, hijacked by hoodlums. And so it was. Uh, street lights, um, even uh, traffic lights, and even uh, road pavements were destroyed. Um, uh, even innocent citizens, some houses, some warehouses, uh, uh, departmental stores. There was a departmental store uh, which um, the whole consignment, the stocks were emptied. So uh, that was the concern because uh, some people may be enlightened and uh, have a purpose of protesting. But uh, the hoodlums, they would take advantage of. Uh, uh, that uh, free-for-all situation will do uh, what uh, the authorities are concerned with. Uh, uh, so, and so uh, that was the situation, uh, that was what happened and uh, the major reason for declaring the 24-hour uh, coffee. Okay, so th that is the government's area, but uh, while you were coming, assessing that area, coming from our station, uh, you must have gone, you know, to some parts of the metropolis. Uh, is there substantial compliance with this curfew by the state government? 
Yes, I, I, I've said as I have said earlier, the compliance is uh, is total. I think, uh, considering the bustling nature of Kano and uh, on a day like this Friday, and uh, but if you come, all the roads are deserted, and um, uh, only security personnel, especially the police, manning the uh, checking points, especially strategic uh, locations because I came from uh, the eastern part of the state passing through the central business district uh, and uh, that area is well guarded well manned by security personnel the police are there doing their job and they are preventing people from moving in, uh, to this end uh, to, to, to the central business district and uh, to the uh, secretariat and the government house which uh, uh, is, uh, we are, where we are standing now so the compliance is, is, is high. There is a total, we can see, uh, everywhere is uh, deserted. The police are in control of the situation. Thank you very much, uh, Abdullah Mustafa. I was asking that question, of course, because you had said something about compliance, but uh, you are able to anticipate where I'm going because be, today being Friday, uh, you know, in a couple of hours, people would want to uh, go and worship. So I understand exactly, uh, you know, to get a sense of what is happening uh, in Kano. Thank you very much for the interventions. But I would I'd li I'd like to, you know, remind you that uh, it's not uh, done and dusted for your beat. We will still return to Kano uh, because of, uh, you know, what happened yesterday to see that, uh, uh, to get an update of, uh, you know, uh, situation there in the course of the day. Thank you so very much, Abdullah Mustafa from Kano. Uh, let me quickly go to Dr. Hayep. Uh, you, were, you were worried about, you know, Kano and uh, some parts of the north in your first intervention. You, you have seen government's uh, response there. That is to clear the streets and say, okay, just stay home. Uh, is that a way to go? Uh, or you need further engagement? You would perhaps uh, advocate for further engagement? Dr. Hayep. All right, we can't uh, seem to be able to connect Dr. Ayap at the moment, uh, but, uh, you know, Mr. Akoji, uh, you, you, you've seen Kano clean uh, uh, as a result of, you know, yesterday's, uh, you know, push and pull. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, you've seen that. Beyond that, we can't keep everybody in those, you know, indefinitely. Mm -hmm. What kind of engagement would, for instance, we we'll be expecting government at that level to do mm. in terms of engagement with the citizenry very quickly? Uh, well, I think this is a period of reprieve uh, at all layers of government that are responsible for citizens' engagement. There shouldn't be any uh, laid-back um, attitude at this point in time. I think that stakeholders traditional rulers, religious leaders uh, should keep up the engagement that's already going on with uh, those who are proponents of these uh, protests. You know? And I think also that on the part of um, the various la layers of government, local, state, and federal, we should ramp up service, service delivery you know, to the people so they can physically see that government is responsive you know, and that we're listening to the complaints that are being put forward and that we're actually doing things to bring suko. All right, we've been in the north. Let's quickly go to the southwest. Femi, uh, our correspondent is in Oshogbo, uh, the Oshun State capital. Uh, Femi, I want to believe it as Femi Afari Ogun uh, in uh, Oshogbo. Uh, he, 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 he's just getting himself ready. Uh, we will be in Oshogbo shortly. Uh, they even uh, stopped a bit early uh, yesterday for okay. what the feelings I got uh, right. Okay, Femi Afari Ogun, uh, we're on to you from Abuja. Tell us what's happening in Oshogbo. Femi, go ahead. Femi, can you hear me? I'm at the center of uh, Oshobo, the Osho state capital now. Uh, the, pro the protest started yesterday here, where they, uh, we had massive turnout of protesters. But today, uh, they gathered at the Freedom Park about two kilometers from here, and the turnout has reduced compared to that of yesterday. Uh, yesterday, it was very, very peaceful here in Oshobo. Uh, the protesters conducted themselves in an orderly manner. 
uh, there were few people that wanted to uh, cause uh, avoc wreck havoc yesterday, but the protesters themselves had to warn themselves to stay, for them to stay calm and not allow anybody vandalize any business uh, outfits. Yesterday, shops were under lock and key, but today people are gradually coming out. Some shops are open, while some are still closed. Security personnel are strategized here at uh, majorly every junction. Look, I can see behind you there's a bridge there, under the bridge, and we're seeing uh, cars moving. It seems as if, uh, uh, you know, business activities have resumed completely, and uh, uh, is it as if it's a day event in the uh, Oshun State, and uh, after that people want to return to, you know, their daily activity? Uh, th th thank you. Uh, pa part of what the protesters are, are saying is for the government to hear their cry. And they, they vow that they are going to put it on hold pending uh, the time they finish the Osho Shobo festival. They are planning to shelve the protest to allow uh, the, Osho, the popular Osho Shobo festival, which, which has started. Okay, thank you, Femi. We'll come back uh, you know, to you in the course of the day and uh, also allow you to enjoy the festival as well. That's uh, Femi Afari from uh, Oshogbo. Uh, on a lighter note, it seems as if, uh, you know, the priorities change and are fluid state per state. Uh, so the, the, I know the people of that state, they don't joke with that particular festival. festival. Uh, it is a spiritual mm -hmm. activity for them and... Uh, Perhaps uh, the protest would, uh, you know, would have to take uh, the bank bench as far as uh, <laughs> uh, the activities there is concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in, just talking about a lighter note, some of the things I saw yesterday uh, were a bit tangentially different from what the protesters had set out to do. Mm -hmm. I saw a completely naked man in Lagos uh, mm -hmm. leading his own protest and, uh, you know, uh, some, uh, you know, naked relations out there, you no know, Jota or was it Oshodi? Mm -hmm. And then we saw uh, a man holding a banner about him being refused visa. I don't know how government was going to come into that particular issue. Uh, there was a woman who was approaching 40 and was complaining about the fact that she had not gotten a husband. Uh, there were some, some protesting against their landlords in terms of increase in rent. And uh, so many things uh, added to the protest. So mm. perhaps uh, it ju was just an opportunity to vent it in one way or the other. Yeah, this is what protest unleashes, especially when it goes on the streets and it's not in a confined uh, space. In some places in Kano, uh, people were chanting that the price of weed had gone too high. This was their reason for protesting. And they kept chanting that, that the price of uh, Indian, hemp. Indian hemp, you know, had become so high. And they were protesting that, um, you know, the hardship is too much because the price of Indian hemp had gone so high. So, you see, these are all unintended consequences which the leadership of these protest groups must take into account and make adequate arrangements to prevent. Like I said earlier on, at times of protest like this, sympathy goes to the leadership of protesters by citizens, you know, and the, the, the leadership of such protest groups uh, become more influential on their followers, you know, than government authorities like us, the National Orientation Agency. This is our experience. And so a lot of responsibility lies on the shoulders of those who are leading this protest to enlighten their followers on what the law provides for in terms of protests. You know, and leadership of this protest group ought to also to understand the fact that um, some of these unintended outcomes are regular any time you carry protests to the streets. Mm. And so conscious of that fact, they need also to engage with people and to advise them on how lawful legal protests ought to be conducted so that we can see less of these damages and loss of lives you know, that we have seen in these and other protests before now that have been done openly on streets. All right, let's uh, perhaps have a recap of what happened yesterday and uh, the situation reports in some states. I think that has been packaged. If, uh, we, if we have it, uh, we would uh, use it uh, as soon as we get uh, those reports in.
the situation report are in some states uh, across the country. If it's ready, let's take it and then we'll continue the discussion. While uh, we're getting uh, it uh, sorted out, talking about the risk situation reports uh, in some states of the uh, Federation, as far as uh, the protest is co concerned, we might, we can uh, see some of them if we just have a few, of, a few of those reports and then we continue with our discussion. Uh, that is not part of our culture and that is not part of our tradition. And uh, we feel that uh, this uh, protest will not be the solution to what people are demanding or what asking for. We believe that there is nobody in this world that can put hardship on you, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it's only Allah that can rescue you from that hardship. Therefore, protest is not a solution, and it should not, will not be a solution. Uh, we found that we realized that how people use young, small, small boys to achieve their objective of vandalizing and stealing people's property. This is not part of our culture and this is not part of our tradition. Therefore, we feel as a government, we should not allow this thing to continue uh, unabated. As a result of that, we are from now, we are introducing a 24-hour curfew in Jigawa State. And this curfew will continue up to the time we have reviewed the situation again with the agencies and we feel it's time to relax it. But for the sake of Friday prayers, uh, we are as, uh, relaxing the curfew from 12 noon to 2.30 p.m. And from there, we to allow people to go to the mosque and pray for the state and pray for the nation. Therefore, but after 2 p.m., the curfew will continue. We pray that uh, people will obey this uh, curfew and ensure that they stay at home and observe the curfew. Uh, we pray, uh, we, I want you this opportunity to thank our traditional institution, thank our ulamas for their support and for the way they call on people to be to restrain from this kind of protest. Uh, we pray that Allah will continue to give us peace in Jigawa and in Nigeria in general. Uh, thank you very much. That's Governor Omar Nawadi of uh, Jigawa State uh, placing a call for you uh, in Jigawa State as a result of some of the acts of violence, uh, acts of violence we saw in parts of the state yesterday and uh, in terms of uh, the expectation of security agencies jigawa was not particularly uh, one of the states that was seen as a flashpoint uh you know historically in the northwest is one of the most peaceful states yeah. uh how did we get here and uh, perhaps uh, how you know in terms of intelligence perhaps we should have been more you know uh proactive in that particular situation Mr. Koji. Yes, you are correct when you say Jigawa State um, has usually been relatively peaceful when you compare that state with others in the northwest uh, region of the, of the country. Um, the traditional rulers and um, religious leaders did tremendous work. And that's why we see that in uh, many parts of the, uh, the country, uh, the expected violent outcomes were not as high you know, as was uh, initially thought. Yeah, uh, the case of Jigawa State is a big surprise. Mm. Yeah. We'll come back to the mm. Jigawa State, but a state that impressed a lot of people yesterday, uh, in, in, you know, putting in, into perspective its history of protests, is Lagos. Mm. Our reporter, Makawo, is uh, on standby in Lagos. Amaka, where exactly are you in Lagos? And uh, perhaps tell us uh, what we are seeing this morning. I can see you in sun shades. It looks as if you are about to go to the beach, but... Uh, uh, just tell us what's happening in Lagos. Okay, many thanks for joining us. I'm not going to the beach, but I'm actually at the Lekki Toll Gate. Uh, it's a very unique spot on Lagos Island. And right here, we can see a lot of security operatives who are on ground. We gathered that yesterday, some protesters came around this area but they were dispersed and told to leave as this is not the designated place for the protest. So coming here today, you can see that some increased number of vehicular movement right here, but the place is free from any form of um, pedestrian movement. Basically, we have policemen mounted right here to ensure there is free flow of vehicles um, straight up and things are 
very peaceful. The um, environment is calm, and people moving and people are driving past the toll gate, uh, devoid of any uh, restrictions. Okay, what was were you here yesterday? Did you pass this uh, particular spot yesterday? How was it yesterday as compared to today? Yeah, perhaps what happened yesterday must have informed that uh, number of uh, po uh, police vehicles and other agents, uh, law enforcement agents there. What happened there yesterday in terms of uh, the number of people uh, around there? Okay, thank you very much. I wasn't here in person. My colleague was here earlier, but we gathered that some protesters, numbering about 30 of them, came here to, you know, uh, protest and they were told to leave this place um, and go to the designated place at the Ojota Park. Now, this place is not one of the places. Recall that uh, during the 2020 enters, uh, the Lekki Gate was one of the places that suffered uh, wanton destruction. And I'm very sure that there's a deliberate effort to make sure that there is any such uh, repeat of such sad incident. So um, the security operatives are really making efforts to ensure there is no form of vandalism across the state, that people protest responsibly and peacefully. And in terms of business activities, uh, before you go to that spot, uh, were they open for business today or is there still the lingering trepidation of, uh, you know, some escalation that could discourage businesses? Yes, sir, you know that the movement of... Oh, we lost that. And Maka. yesterday we could see that businesses were at the lowest ebb, but right now... Go ahead, go ahead, please. But you can see that uh, more people uh, have taken the bold step to come out. And you can see that there are a lot of businesses who depend on day-to-day -day transactions to make a living. And so talking about those protests, we need to look at the economic implications in the lives of people. Yes, people come out to prospect peacefully, but there are those who will suffer the implications of staying indoors because uh, they depend daily on day-to-day -day sales about some of these itinerant traders and uh, so far I must say that a lot of businesses small-scale businesses have been affected by people staying indoors but today we can see that more people are out there going about their businesses thank you Amaka stay safe uh, we'll try and come back to you perhaps at another location uh, as you move around town to give us an update Amaka Owo from Lagos thank you very much for your contribution all right Amaka uh, giving us an update there that is uh, a place of uh, memories uh, as far as the NSAS protest is concerned today it's uh, devoid of activities you want to say something yes you see I wonder if um, the the leadership of these protest groups took into consideration the point that Amaka just made the economic implication of a 10-day protest because that is what they had proposed you shut the economy down for 10 days what is the implication on even those that you are protesting to assist? It is correct what Amaka said, that a preponderance of our national population are the, in the informal economy, where earnings are made as an outcome of daily going out to do your trade, to deploy your skills in exchange for value. You know? And imagine that um, people have to sit at home, you know, barbers, vulcanizers, women, you know, and so on and so forth, mechanics, you know, and all of that, for 10 days without any earnings. I don't think that position uh, is sympathetic to the plight of those that the protesters are claiming to be wanting to um, assist. So I'm glad that uh, to a large extent normalcy is returning to a lot of the states that we have reviewed. This is not to say that we can shout Uhuru. The engagement will continue. National Orientation Agency will continue to do what it has always done, uh, engage with community members across the country, uh, make appeals to religious leaders to also lend their voices and traditional rulers, while urging government to also become more responsive to some of the issues that are driving this protest narrative and lending credence to the leadership of the protest uh, groups. You, know. you take government's message to the people. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the feedback mechanism, uh, did you, do you also steal their thoughts and then send back to government? In terms of some of these 
uh, pressures that uh, they are seeing on a daily basis. For instance, some people have alluded to the fact that failure of governance, not at the center alone, mm -hmm. but now at the grassroots, could have been perhaps precipitated what we are seeing at this point. The lack of responsive, uh, responsive, responsive governance at the grassroots for, mm -hmm. for a start, then, um, you know, uh, when you now escalate to the state level, still no response, mm. then, you know, the anger becomes pent up. You see, this is one of the issues that um, actually troubles um, us at the National Orientation Agency. Because we are embedded in the fabric of society in the grassroots, as a result of our national footprint of offices in the 774 local governments, we are able to feel the pulse of the nation, you know, and we do generate reports like you asked, feedback. You know, our people go out in the markets, go out in the parks, go to social gatherings, and they listen. They do civil intelligence gathering. Part of the information that we put in the Pulse of the Nation reports, which we send to responsible offices uh, in the three different arms of government, is what the people are saying concerning the price of food, the changing landscape in, in, in terms of the pricing of staple foods like tomato, like gari, like maize, and all of that. So we put all of this in the Pulse of the Nation reports regularly, and we send them out, you know, so that um, authorities at the state and federal levels will get an understanding of the impact that some of these policies that are being rolled out, both at state and uh, federal level, are having directly on the lives, you know, of, of the people. Now, with regards to what's going on in the local governments, we're very glad, and this uh, government needs to gain a lot of credit on account of that, you know, in pushing this case and getting the Supreme Court to make pronouncement on uh, local government autonomy. At the National Orientation Agency, how we have responded to that is this. I did say to you earlier on that day before yesterday, I came back from Bauchi. At night, I, around, I arrived at Abuja around 11 p.m., uh, just on the eve of the start of these protests. Now, what was I doing in Bauchi? There's a, a campaign that we're starting that will be taken to the 36 states, and we started from Bauchi. We're engaging with uh, local government chairmen, their secretaries, and treasurers. And the conversation is this. Now that they have autonomy, they shouldn't take anything for granted. The reason why this administration went the whole hog like it did to get the Supreme Court to make a judgment in favor of local government autonomy is a deliberate intention to ensure that development, the impact of government and governance, reaches people at the local level. So chairmen would have more control over their resources. And those resources have increased as a result of the removal of subsidy on fuel and, and the increased revenue you know, as an outcome uh, that is accruing to government. So more funds are going to state governments, more funds are going to local governments. It now remains, how do we advocate that these funds are properly utilized? in a manner that impacts directly on the people and reduces the sufferings that's fueling these agitations for protests, you know? So we're going to engage with people at that grassroots governance level on a continuous basis. We hope to partner with um, agencies like EFCC and ICPC so that um, the guys who are chairmen at the local government will understand the fact that they don't have immunity and that they can be held immediately responsible if they misuse the resources that will now be at their disposal as local government chairman, instead of applying those resources to bring succor and reduce the suffering of people at the grassroots. All right, uh, we'll take a report soon. Uh, the IGP, you know, who has placed, placed uh, you know, police formations on the red alert. Uh, we understand that, uh, you know, the Nigerian police force has placed all its commands uh, for... Of, uh, in formations and units on red alert and officers have been fully mobilized to respond swiftly and decisively to any further threats to public safety and order. Uh, our own reporter Francis Form reports that uh, the Inspector General of Police, uh, Kari Degbeto, could disclose this at a media briefing in Abuja. The police is equipped to respond appropriately to the unfolding situations and will get assistance from other security agencies including the military, if the need arises. We appeal to all citizens to remain calm and cooperate with the police and other security agencies during this challenging period. Your safety is our top priority, and we will continue to take all the measures to ensure continued peace and stability 
in our country. IGP Egbetokun also reminded groups who are hiding under the guise of exercising their constitutional right of assembly to destabilize the country to remember that the same constitution imposed on them the duty to obey the laws of the land and respect the rights of other citizens. All right, that's the IGP and uh, some states, you know, are now on, you know, red alert. And uh, one of the states uh, that uh, a coffee was imposed is uh, Meduguri and Abubaka is there. Uh, Abubaka Musa, please, uh, if you are, you know, listening to me, can you give us an update of what is happening in your center out there in Meduguri? Abubaka. Abubaka, can you give us uh, a situation update in uh, Meduguri? I can see that your line is not too strong, it's shrinking and returning, but uh, uh, just tell us what is happening. All right, um, that's true. Um, Fisayo, the network has uh, not been stable, actually. But um, I must tell you that Meduguri, the Borno state capital and its environment, Go ahead if you if you are still on. We'll come back to you. I can hear. You. Okay, go ahead, please. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Uh, like I said, uh, Fisayo, um, the network has actually not been good here, but uh, thank God it's um, a bit okay now. Uh, Meduguri, the Borno State capital, and its um, environs are calm and peaceful right now with uh, most residents adhering to the curfew imposed on the state. Unlike yesterday, when there was pandemonium almost, um, uh, you know, everywhere due to the nationwide protest. Uh, imposition of the curfew was uh, the best decision taken uh, because uh, the protest would have um, turned into something else if uh, the government did not impose um, a curfew on the state maybe a violence or something of that nature. However, information made available uh, to us indicates that the government, in collaboration with other security organizations, have now relaxed the curfew from 12 noon to 3 p.m. Um, just for today, uh, following the improvement in the security situation. Okay, in terms of, uh, have you gone out this morning, uh, in terms of uh, movement, has there been substantial compliance? We spoke with a colleague in Kano, and he told me that the streets were deserted uh, in compliance with the curfew uh, by the state government there. What about in your center? Is there substantial, you know, compliance with this curfew? Um, yes, uh, most residents here in Medjugorje are complying uh, with the curfew. Uh, I didn't go out today because I, even yesterday I was almost assaulted despite the fact that uh, I'm, I, I was uh, I identified myself as an essential service uh, provider, but I had to use diplomacy, you know, uh, to return home. I was able to speak to some of my colleagues earlier today and they told me that um, deploy to the metropolis and its environs. Uh, you only find few pedestrians moving around trying to get, uh, you know, something uh, maybe to eat. Thank you very much, Abaka Musa from Meduguri. We'll get back to you as well and other colleagues there. Hopefully uh, things would improve and uh, you guys also uh, try to stay, stay safe uh, in those centers. Uh, well, let's go to Kebi. Uh, Benin Kebi, Abdul Jalil is there. If 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 uh, he's on, I will join him uh, shortly. We understand he's just getting his kids ready uh, to speak to us because we have guys all over the country at the moment uh, putting their hand, hands on, uh, you know, the situations there and trying to make sure that uh, they give us a feedback on, uh, you know, and updates on uh, what is happening in different locations. Yesterday, I uh, saw some 
you know, senior police officers uh, exhibit the highest level of professionalism. Mm. Some even joined in the marching mm. just to make sure that they were encouraging the, you know, uh, protesters to go in certain directions. Yes. Some, you know, uh, spoke with them, you know, and advised in terms of uh, the what to do and what not to do. And, uh, you know, we saw, especially in centers like uh, uh, Benin, uh, Lagos, and, the, you know, the crowd, the citizens there uh, were enthused with the uh, what the police did in terms of uh, maintaining law and order and the interaction they had with law enforcement agents. Not all uh, states had uh, such, uh, you know, actualities. Uh, but uh, in the cases where we saw a demonstration of, uh, you know, uh, citizens' responsibility and good police, uh, you know, work as well, uh, what would be your comment at this time? And in the, those, those places also that uh, left a little to, you know, to be... Uh, Oh, but I, I understand Abdul Jalil is ready before you, you know, respond to this. Okay. Abdul Jalil, in being in Kirby, uh, when you're ready, you know, just let us know. Uh, we can see you bleeping online, but once you are ready, l let us know. Okay, so what would be your comment on, you know, on those interactions yesterday? Uh, Fisayo, I want to specifically comment the Inspector General of Police and the leadership of the police at this time for the roles that they have played. Now, why am I saying this? The police is the lead agency for internal security. And the IGP stepped forward and took that responsibility in a commendable way. You recall that he called for engagement with the identified section of the leaderships of the promoters of this protest, of, of one of the leaderships. You know, um, His intention was to let them into the security reports you know, of some of the things that were being planned outside of the plans of the leadership of these protesters that they needed to know so that they'll be guided on how they go about it. But they didn't want a physical meeting. That meeting was held online. And I'm sure you saw, you know, how it was conducted with utmost respect from the Inspector General of Police himself to the leadership of those protesters. All, all right, sir. We understand that Abdul Jalil is now ready in Benin Kebi. Abdul Jalil, if you can uh, go ahead with your report. Well, thank you, studio. Right now, I'm at uh, the government house road in Burning Kebi, the Kebi state capital, uh, where it, uh, ye as of yesterday by now, this is the meeting point of the protesters. But as you can see, uh, the place is relatively calm compared to yesterday. Uh, people are going about doing their normal businesses. Only the security personnel are stationed at uh, uh, sensitive places in the state capital. As uh, the state assets and uh, public uh, properties are located in order to maintain uh, law and order there. And in respect to that, yesterday Governor Nasri Idris of Kebi State in the night uh, conveyed an emergency meeting with heads of security agencies uh, in the state to review the, the, the yesterday's protest where he appealed to the protesters to uh, use dialogue and also to uh, and not to uh, uh, destroy public properties because these properties are the properties of Kebbi state people. Uh, their funds were used to build this property. So he emphasized that uh, destroying or vandalizing the properties is just like they are starving themselves because it's their own money that was used to build them and it's their money that will be used to rebuild these properties. Uh, he equally called on parents uh, because uh, what we Today you will see children on their age uh, during the process. So he called on parents not to allow the, their children to partake into uh, in, in the uh, protest. Thank you very but much. As of now, the, 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 the burning cabin is calm. As you can see behind me, people are conducting their businesses. Okay, uh, of course we can see cars moving behind you and uh, there's a police van right there as well. But on your way there, were the shops open apart from uh, free flow of movement we are seeing now. Well, you know, the shops opened, those shops that were closed yesterday, are they now open for business? Uh, every business in uh, uh, Burning Kebbi, the state capital, is opened because uh, uh, people are. Uh, Having been the camera campaign behind, you will see even the people selling watermelon, 
mangoes and uh, oranges are there uh, conducting their businesses. So uh, businesses are open in Brennan Kebi and it's calm uh, because this place, as of yesterday, one cannot even come close to this place. But uh, as you can see, the movement of uh, vehicles. Uh, I don't know whether your cameraman is also part of the protest, but he refused to uh, pan to see some of the things that uh, uh, we wanted to see there. But we'll come back to you, Abijeli, a very good uh, reporter on the status of what is happening out there uh, in uh, Kerbi State, been in Kerbi. Uh, moving forward, uh, let's uh, take uh, one or two of the you know stories that uh, we have here. Of course, the Sultan of Sokoto. Uh, Sultan of Sokoto Muhammad Saad Abubakar and the President General Supreme Council of Islamic Affairs uh, has once again appealed to the protest convenors uh, and uh, over benefactors as well as other critical stakeholders to shift their swords uh, and urgently come to the table for dialogue. In a statement, the Sultan expressed the fear of the protest being escalated to an uncontrollable state as reports are tilting towards that. Uh, therefore, uh, he appealed for an end to the exercise. The royal father also called for understanding for Nigerians to protect the stability, as it is uh, to protect stability. As it's only uh, then that uh, countrymen could proudly call themselves citizens. He urges imams and Muslim leaders to use the Friday Juma uh, service to calm nerves and call on call on the Ummah to appreciate peace than chaotic state of affairs which could deny citizens uh, congregational prayers. Referring to the verses of the Quran, the Sultan appealed to religious adherents to be more devoted to Allah during uh, trying moments and display high character in obedience to the holy books and constituted authorities. Uh, of course, the royal fathers and the spiritual leaders as well wading in and also trying to calm the citizens and also, you know, uh, uh, give their word against those who are also trying to uh, tilt the narratives towards issues of uh, politics as well as uh, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, different uh, confrontations they've had in the past that have brought on board uh, mm -hmm. into this uh, one as well. So uh, we've spoken about that. I don't know whether we some of our uh, discussions are still on. We've not been able to, you know, get Dr. Ayep for a while if he's still on Zoom. If we can still get Dr. Ayeb, if he's not still on Zoom, but uh, we, we encourage him to still rejoin if his uh, uh, signal is better, and then we would, uh, you know, uh, connect with him as well. But uh, Mohammed is in Kaduna. Uh, Mohammed, uh, can you tell us? I understand it's Umar Rajingi that is in Kaduna. Umar Rajingi. Uh, how are you? Are you at the government house today, or where exactly are you in Kaduna? Well, I'm not at the government house now. I'm at uh, Independence Way, uh, one of the major streets in Kaduna, taken over by the protesters uh, yesterday. Uh, yesterday, in their large number, the protesters uh, took over the major street. Uh, of Kaduna State registering some of uh, their grievances where the peaceful protest was suddenly hijacked by some hoodlum where the Kaduna State Traffic Law Enforcement Agency popularly known as Castelia Office was vandalized as well as the Kaduna State Investment Promotion Agency Office uh, that was touched. Uh, the youth yesterday made an attempt to gain access to the government house but they were resisted by the security agencies who are quite uh, on ground. Uh, or like uh, yesterday, today the state is generally peaceful. Uh, we've not seen any protesters uh, on the streets of Kaduna today. It is relatively calm. And then we've seen uh, people going about their normal uh, activities. Although uh, the state is not uh, with the usual hustle and bustle of people, where I am right now is uh, Independence Way. And you know the Independence Way is one of the busiest uh, road in Kaduna State, but uh, it is deserted today. Uh, we suspect that people are at home monitoring the situation uh, before they started uh, coming out to continue their normal uh, activities. Yesterday, the police public relations officer made a press release available that they have arrested about uh, 24 
to 25 of these are uh, hoodlums who have been suspected to have participated in vandalizing some of these uh, government uh, property. And the governor also yesterday had a security meeting with the security agencies on ground in the state to review the security situation in the state where most of the people in the state were suspecting that uh, because of uh, the outbreak of violence, the state government will impose a coffee. But the governor said they are still monitoring the situation. Uh, there is no any coffee imposed in Kaduna State. They are still monitoring the situation. And yesterday, most of these protesters, the governor said, you can, we, we've also seen the old, uh, where they had a very intelligent report that some of these youth, small children uh, were given money by some miscreants to come out and, and create uh, some disturbances in the state. Anyway, Umar Ajingi, we are losing your uh, uh, signals there, but I think the point has been made. Kaduna, no call for you. The governor uh, says uh, to, uh, to see uh, the situation of things. Thank you very much, Umar Ajingi. Um, the point has been made. As far as Kaduna is concerned, no coffee, but they are monitoring the situation, the governor and security agents are there. And being uh, a state, you know, that is, uh, you know, linked to other states there, it's strategic to continue monitoring, you know, the situation in Kaduna as well. Yeah, you know, Kaduna has had its unique um, history of being somewhat volatile. You know, so I'm glad that the governor is on top of the situation and the security agencies are also monitoring uh, the situation. I think at a time like this, uh, there shouldn't be any lay back, laying back on the part of authorities um, at all levels. There should be vigilance. Um, so I was saying that I commend the IGP and his team, you know, for the leadership that they have shown in the course of this protest uh, so far. I made reference to the engagement that um, he had with a section of the leadership of the protesters, you know, which happened online. Yesterday again, and you just showed that clip, he, um, he, he, he was briefing the nation, you know, on how things have gone and on the position that the police is taking. So his professional posture, as far as this protest is concerned, is what is percolating down and you are seeing reflecting in the leadership of the police at state and other levels. And why you have not seen violent outcomes in many parts of the country. You made reference of uh, the police in some cases joining the protesters to ensure that they gain definite direction and they conduct themselves uh, orderly. So these are uh, uh, reasons why we think that the commendation should go to the police and the leadership of the police, you know, the way they have gone about this um, so far. Even though we're seeing calm returning to most parts of the country, it is important for security agencies to still be on top of their game. And I say this because of what your reporter just said from Kaduna, that some little uh, children were found to have been given money to cause mayhem by interest groups. And this is what we have always said, you know, that protest creates fertile environment for people with negative mindset, you understand, to carry out their nefarious activities. That report that you just saw coming from Kaduna is an instance you know, uh, what kind of interest groups will give money to, to miscreants and say, go cause uh, mayhem? What is the interest, you know, in that? And these are some of the things that even the propagators of protests should take into uh, consideration. So they can also increase their advocacy to enlighten people that, look, this is what this protest is about. It is not about anybody taking revenge on any system because of their selfish interests, you know, or whatever. All right, let's uh, take a report from Bauchi. Uh, if the report from Bauchi is uh, ready, the Bauchi State Commissioner of Police, Awal Musa Mohammed, says uh, 52 suspects uh, were apprehended by the command in relation to violence during the August 1st nationwide protest in the state. The commissioner, commissioner also lamented act of intimidation by some protesters, a situation that has led many people uh, to various degrees of injuries who are currently receiving medical attention. Sir Muhammad, while parading the suspect, said the police were able to control the situation. We have to react and charge them equally by using smoke. We are able to arrest almost 52 of them and we are going to charge them to court. The police commissioner used the opportunity to remind people about the IGP's directive on the need 
to stage their protest at one place so that the situation would not be a source of security breach in Bauchi. Ablai Aminu, NTA News. All right, our police in Bauchi arresting up to 52 people uh, there uh, yesterday. Perhaps uh, that's another area that uh, they should uh, keep, you know, keep a lead on things the way, you know, uh, <laughs> things are going, especially uh, in that axis. Bauchi, 52. Uh, you know, you I know. told you I was in Bauchi up until 11 p.m. thereabouts uh, on the eve of this protest um, when I left. And in Bauchi, the extent of work that was done on the ground in terms of engagement with community members by religious leaders, political leaders, and um, traditional leaders gave me the impression when I was on ground that we wouldn't see the kind of thing that I'm seeing here now with 50-something people being arrested. Up until the time I left, Bauchi was calm. And we were almost thinking that nothing uh, untoward will happen. You know? So to see this outcome now, emphasizes the point that is being made that um, mm -hmm. even though we're seeing calm in many parts of the country now, uh, security agencies should still be on their, on their alert and on their toes. They should take nothing for granted. All right, uh, coming back to the FCT, just to remind uh, our viewers of the stance of the minister of the FCT, uh, Yeson Wiki, who said that protesters should uh, confine their convergence to the MKU Abiola Stadium as directed by the court. Uh, this was uh, at an emergency meeting with security agents and uh, area council chairman. Aisha Bali reports. Minister who called for an emergency meeting with security agencies, area council chairman and the head of FCT civil service says the government is aware of the demands of the protesters and is gradually acting on them. In the meantime, he warns protesters to respect court orders and remain at the Moshud Abiola Stadium. We have come out to say clearly that one of the reasons government is appealing to you not to carry this protest that we believe some miscreants will take advantage and cause men and cause destruction of property within their city. See what has happened in most of the states today. He notes that the agreement was to carry out a peaceful protest as security agencies in the FCT will not allow people to take laws into their hands and cause mayhem for FCT populists. He however commends the FCT residents who have decided to stay away from the protest venues to give peace and dialogue a chance. In Abuja, Aisha Uba Ali, NTE News. All right, uh, Aisha Bali with uh, that report. Let's go to Sokoto. Uh, our correspondent is ready there uh, to give us an update of what happened at the seat of the Caliphate. Oh, you are in the office. Go ahead. Hello. G good morning. You are welcome to Sokoto, the seat of the Caliphate. Uh, of course, uh, you too in Sokoto yesterday participated actively in the nationwide protest. The protest which started peacefully but later turned out to be violent because some public structures were destroyed and that informed the decision of police to intervene. Uh, right uh, together with me here is the, the Commissioner of Police, uh, Ali Hayatu Kaigama. And I will ask him to brief us of the happenings yesterday the arrest, if there is any, and what they intend to do to contain what is likely to happen today, since today is the second day of the nationwide protest. Sir. Uh, you are welcome to Sokoto. Let me use this opportunity uh, to please uh, inform you officially that you are presently with the Commission of Police, Sokoto State Police Command. CP Ali Hayatu Kaigama. Uh, yesterday, can you tell us what happened in brief and have you made any arrest? Uh, actually, what happened in brief yesterday was that uh, before yesterday, before the fateful day of yesterday, we have been having this since the idea of this protest was muted. Myself, the Commissioner of Police, has, and my dear colleagues from other security agencies in Sokoto States have not rested on our oars. Uh, since that idea has been muted, we have been strategizing along with the state government 
the state government went to the extent of inviting town hall meeting involving all critical stakeholders and all assured his excellency the governor the governor of sokoto state that there won't be anything like protest because whatever they were trying to protest against they were informed that the government of the the federal government have started working on some of these uh, demands they have been making and it was made known and they were told that actually the issue of protest is immaterial for now their mission was to pass a message and the message was well passed and the government did not ignore them the government promised them wholeheartedly that they are working assiduously to ensure that their needs and demands will be met unfortunately that of yesterday, Sokoto being a unique state, the seat of the caliphate, we are full of almajiris around. The number of people that started coming in, pathetically, they were these youths that we describe in the police or other security agencies as young persons. They were virtually teenagers. When we saw them marching the street, we felt well. Every other Nigerian is free to exercise his right. And therefore, we provided, along with my uh, other colleagues from other security agencies, we provided them with security to give them maximum cover, which we did. Along the line, all along, because as they progresses, a lot of the youths that were mischief makers started infiltrating these uh, teenagers. Along the line, the whole thing break loose and behold they went back and they started destroying they started destroying government infrastructure public properties and once that is done your guess is as good as mine the police and other security agencies will not fold their arms and watch that to continue we must not allow them to bring our state to its knees we quickly intervened, and behold, a lot of arrests were made. As I'm talking to you, they are already, they are already charged to court, and the issue, the, 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 the court is presiding over their issue for mischief and vandalization of government property. And we are still on top of our games to ensure that if only other security, I mean, other protestants are willing to come out. We gave them an enabling environment to exercise their right, which they fail woefully. Once they fail, the security agencies, like I said before, we cannot watch and sit down and watch. How many people have you so far, how many people have you so far arrested? We arrested uh, 83 miscreants miscreants who were arrested live while vandalizing government infrastructure in with during the protests in some states curfew has been imposed are you thinking about that here i'm not thinking about it i trust my other colleagues from other security agencies since the issue of this protest was muted all our hands has been on deck and it has never been lifted for a minute. That gave us the result we have achieved yesterday. And if you can hear me, after the result of yesterday, the after the protests of yesterday, we equally sat down late in the yeah. night to appraise our action of yesterday and to strategize against today, which we have definitely done. And we, def we believe that uh, today's protest will just be a walkover for the security agencies. Thank yeah. you. If you can hear me, ask the CP uh, in terms of engagement, because we just read the uh, statement by the Sultan in terms of consultation, and it was appealing to them and also appealing to you know, religious leaders to engage these people, apart from ensuring safety and uh, of uh, government property and safety of lives in your center, uh, is there other, are there other engagements right now going on, in spite, you know, uh, putting into consideration what transpired yesterday? As the CP. About engagement. Even before this time, you have engaged a lot of stakeholders. 
I mean, uh, stakeholders were engaged even before this time, so that uh, uh, the tension would be would be minimal. Maybe what other engagement do you intend to do to ensure that? Okay, is there any engagement going on now? Actually, the engagement going on now, uh, after appraising our action of yesterday, last night, we were able to get across some, from some imams and pastors to use their forum to still warn that any protestant that is willing to come out and cause mischief to any government infrastructure will not be allowed to do that. Yes, I assure, I assure the good people of Sokoto State, most of the people, the youths that came out, they, like I said before, they were teenagers who doesn't even know. If you ask them why were they protesting, some cannot even explain. Some cannot even explain. I had cause to ask some of these youths that what were you, what were you really protesting? And I had cause to tell them, if you don't know, you said hardship. The government has come up with different interventions to cushion the hardship, if at all there is hardship, to cushion the hardship. They have started, they have distributed grains, they have distributed, they have distributed a lot of palliative, at least to cushion this. And this is short term, and we believe the long term is in the pipeline. And there was no need for any protest whatsoever. Thank you very much, uh, the CP uh, Ali Hayatu Kegama, CP Sokoto State. Uh, now we will now rejoin uh, Abuja for continuation of the program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for a moment, I thought that was the office. So thank you very much for going to talk directly to the CP, uh, the CP Kaigama, uh, talking about uh, the situation in Sokoto and that uh, his men are on top of the situation. Several arrests made already in terms of the uh, vandalization of uh, infrastructure in that state. And that is in spite of the plea uh, by the Sultan uh, to shelf uh, the protest. Talk about JISSA to the President of Media and Publicity has just joined us. Uh, before you came in, I was discussing with the director uh, in the National Orientation Agency. A lot of people have put uh, some you know, of this on your table in terms of communication. They say some of the youths, uh, some of the people protesting, some of the people at the grassroots, don't really know what is happening. And that has created a vacuum where, you know, subversive, subservice, uh, subversive elements have perhaps hijacked the situation, that the communication has not been smooth enough, has not been wide enough. Uh, do you agree, or is it work in progress? Well, uh, go government communication is always a continuous uh, work, is a work in progress. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, I, I won't... Uh, totally agree with those who have the view that uh, uh, communication, it, it, can never, it, it can never be, there's no hang to communication. It's a continuous thing, you continue to engage. In terms of uh, getting government communication to, to, to percolate to the grassroots, we are working with private media organization, working with uh, government uh, media organization, and you just mentioned NOA. NOA has offices in 774 local government, they have state offices. So we are using every available means of mass communication to reach uh, the people in terms of informing them about government programs and pol policies and, and initiatives. And uh, like rightly said, uh, like I heard you uh, uh, while you were speaking with the uh, Commissioner of Police in, in, um, in uh, Chokoto State. We have also reached out to civil society organizations, religious leaders, traditional rulers, who are also helping to reach out to the people because they actually live among the people. So we we'll continue to engage, we we'll continue to use every available means, both digital and, mainstream and traditional media, to, to, to reach the people. So it's a continuous work. Okay, well, you, you know, there have been engagements, appeal by the government, and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people will say, perhaps one, major challenges of this particular protest was the fact that it was uh, largely faceless. Uh, now we've seen the first day. How do you now really engage in terms of tabling of, uh, uh, you know, demands, you know, and then assuaging those uh, 
demands and fears. Uh, how do you, you know, put a lead on this to be able to, you know, control this because of the perhaps uh, hydra-headed nature of those who are even calling for this? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, like you said, the post, the protest is faceless. Uh, you really do. Of course, one or two people uh, came out to to say they are the they are the leaders of the protest, but really, likely, it's, it's, it's faceless. And that is what government has been saying that those who have any grievances should come forward and present their case before government. Of course, generally, there is a, the headline of the protest is build around hunger and the current economic uh, challenges, which government is addressing frontally. So is, um, we'll continue to, and then you also look at some of the demands. Some of them are political, some are economic. So the political one focuses on people asking for a change of, uh, to change, uh, canceling the constitution, which is practically impossible. <laughs> that is the grand norms of the, of the country. The entire governmental structure of Nigeria as it, as, it, as it is today is built on the constitution. So if you are saying it should be canceled, you are invariably saying the, the government of Nigeria should be canceled. So then there are also demands around the um, unicameral legislature that Senate should be, should be abolished. So I think those are not demands that relate to or, or the economic reality. Or the economic reality. So they're political. But the one around economic issues, of course, we all agree that the country is not going through, is going through some economic patches. But Nigeria is not the it's not the only country in the world. The, the economic challenges is everywhere in the world. Every country is battling with inflation. And this is occasioned by the world has not even recovered from COVID-19. The global economy was shut down for two years between 2020 and 2022. Then global supply chain has been disrupted. So it means that cost of goods and services everywhere had skyrocketed. If you look at the ship, go, go, let's look at the, the, the shipping costs around the world. 40 foot container that you could bring from China to Nigeria before, maybe under $3,000. It's probably over $10,000. And it's everywhere in the world. So every government in the world is fighting every day to battle and control inflation. Okay, let, let me take the position of the Nigerian, or yeah. perhaps even the protester. Yeah. Uh, we are talking about what is happening around the world. Yeah. And we are seeing a situation, you know, in the country, especially at the sub-nationals. Yeah. Because I continue to say that this governance and issues that we are talking about is from the three, three tiers of government. It is failure at the sub-nationals that escalates to the national. That's first, that's, you know, as a Nigerian. Yeah. Now, we have communities where there are rice fields lying fallow, places where I've served as a Yucopa, places where I've worked before, rice fields lying fallow. Yet, the governors and the governments are collecting grains of rice from the federal government. You have years of not planting. And then you are collecting, uh, the world view looks to me to be so far no. esoteric. So, I'm just saying that for, so for so the Nigerian I'm at coming, the basis. I'm coming to deal with the local variables. I was trying to globalize the issue. There is the global dimension and there is the local dimension. Please go ahead. Now, coming back home, of course, Nigerians live in the states and in the local governments. So those are the communities where Nigerians live. I always, I've always told people 95% of what affects our life every day are governance issues that are within the purview of states and local government. So truly, is our states and local governments need to do more. The federal government, President Tinubu, is working with the governors and encouraging them to do more. Now, about 15 states have been identified to have comparative advantage in different agricultural produce, whether rice, wheat, sorghum, maize. So through, working through the Ministry of uh, Agriculture and Food Security, 
and the Governors Forum, I know a lot of states are currently engaging in massive food production. But of course, there is time for all of this. Niger State, as I know, is cultivating almost one million hectares of, uh, of land to produce uh, different uh, 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 agricultural produce that will also help in bringing down the cost of uh, uh, food items. So really, a whole lot of work needs to be done, especially at the sub level. I agree totally with you. I agree totally with you. All right, I know it. Um, <laughs> some will say early warning signs, you know, always help in, in mitigating some of these issues. You, just like, you know, the SSA said, you have, you know, offices nationwide. Mm -hmm. What is the level of engagement? First of all, to let them know that uh, it's the gestation period for some of these concepts, for some of these policies, mm -hmm. uh, will take this and this period. Just wait. If we don't now, you know, we come true to our words, then you can come out. But this is the gestation period for some of these concepts to reach fruition. Uh, is that engagement ongoing? Because uh, the way we have spontaneous protests as if there has not been engagement or at least, uh, you know, perhaps you are beating the drum outside the fence, not inside the house. No, this is not altogether true. Okay, go ahead. Engagements are constantly ongoing, you know. Um, for instance, before now, we have using digital and traditional platforms, been engaging with various population demographies, you know, on the policies uh, of government that are beneficial especially to the youth segments. Uh, yes, there's um, hardship, but there are several interventions that government is doing uh, to I intervene you know, and mitigate uh, these hardships. We've been engaging community members on issues, for instance, like the uh, National Education Loan uh, Fund you know, and how uh, youths can benefit you know, from this. You know, uh, even if you go to our website currently, you will find a lot of this information. I spoke to you about our inter uh, artificial intelligence persona, which is able to explain details of the rule. Several schools, federal and state, universities, polytechnics, and all of that have enrolled, and people are actually already benefiting. You know, so we're engaging communities on this uh, as an intervention by the federal government to mitigate issues of escalating school fees and difficulties on the part of parents, you know, to send their children to school. It is working. It's happening even as I speak with you, you know, uh, at the moment. And then intervention in the agri um, sector, intervention in terms of deploying CNG conversion kits across states so that people can exit the high cost of premium motor spirit at the moment and then take advantage of the more economic, uh, yes, uh, CNG uh, option, you know. And we are talking even about plans that are in the pipeline, you know. NO is engaging with Federal Minister of Finance and the Federal Minister of Humanitarian Affairs on a plan that is in the pipeline and will soon come to fruition of creating a platform where university graduates who are yet to find employment can be getting uh, benefits of up to 70,000 Naira uh, a month. You know, so what is important at this point in time is to give government time. Give government time to focus on this. Look at this protest now. This protest has taken a lot of resources, very scarce resources from government in terms of the security deployments that you see across the country. Those resources ought to be plugged into getting us out of this situation not deployed into creating national security presence, you know, to, uh, to, to prevent miscreants and those who do not wish our country well from taking over the space and then uh, causing all kinds of chaos like we have seen in some of the states that has led to death, burning and destruction of public and private property and economic losses as a result of the fact that people cannot, could not go out even as at yesterday to do their businesses. All right. Um, uh you know, as we say, we are all Nigerians. Uh, beyond <laughs> even where we work, we are all Nigerians. Mm -hmm. And uh, what one we want to commend the government for, especially the Attorney General of the Federation, pursuing this local government autonomy, autonomy issue to the, you know, Project to the conclusion, mm -hmm. uh, to the point that now we have some you know, financial autonomy uh, for the local governments. But while I said some, because in terms of the colorization of the local governments at the moment, we still need electoral, mm -hmm. you know, 
uh, autonomy in terms of even the kind of guys who get themselves into these positions. Mm -hmm. First of all, for the people to have a connect, a connect with the uh, local authorities, councillors, and all that, this tension will be down at that level. Yes. Before you get, and when we have states, so many states with caretakers, mm -hmm. some of them have never visited the local government secretaries before they were appointed. They mm -hmm. don't know anybody there. They collect things from the state capital. They even live in the state capital. How do you know when trouble is festering in your domain? So uh, we, we'll go into that. I understand that we have a correspondent online uh, to join us. Please, if you're there, please let us know where you're uh, you know, joining us from and what the situation is uh, in your location. Oh, yes, Enugu. Uh, please uh, just... Uh, Tell Enugu. us where you are. You were at the Michael Okwara uh, Square yesterday. Where, where are you today? I look calm as uh, yesterday. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yes, yes. Today. <laughs> yes, we are at uh, the popular Otiba roundabout in New Heaven Junction. In, that, this is the heart of the cold city. And uh, from what we saw yesterday, the, the volume of uh, vehicular and human our movement has increased tremendously and people have come out to do their jobs uh, undisturbed. The banking halls, we went to the banks and they are open. The ATM machines are working. People are trooping in and out of the banks. Um, we also saw supermarkets open. Quite unlike yesterday, no supermarket was open. Today, marketplaces are also open and we saw people trekking, moving, you know, with traffic, uh, incre increase in traffic, people also are moving about even without vehicles, freely moving about. And today also there's less presence of, uh, of the security personnel that we saw yesterday. We saw troops of personnel yesterday. All right, Chigo, Chigo no Onu is uh, 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 getting us in from uh, Enugu to tell us what happened there yesterday. Uh, like I alluded to, there was uh, not much. Uh, the micro opera square where they were supposed to converge, it was uh, largely quiet. And she was actually looking for the protesters as against, uh, you know, <laughs> them being uh, somewhere. But uh, that is the situation. And it was a case of different strokes for different folks uh, across the country. Uh, we had, you know, before you came in, our reporter from Oshobo was saying that the people were more interested in the Oshobo festival <laughs> as against uh, any protest. And they were already, you know, adopted in different uh, attacks. I think uh, generally across the southern part of the country, there wasn't really any issue. I think the hotbed, uh, the hotspot yesterday were uh, some states in the, in the northern part. Yes, so, if I'm to quote Stalin, he says the real population is the one that you did not plan for. That, that is the real population. And we have seen some things play out in the north. Uh, the Commissioner of Police, Kagama, in uh, Sokoto alluded to this. Mm -hmm. Our is children who are on the streets and all that have become vulnerable yeah. and become cannon fodder for yeah. terror. Uh, also in Kano, we saw underaged uh, people coming out on the streets. Now, this is another aspect that we should look at as a keg of uh, gunpowder, gun as far as the country is concerned, to capture this, uh, you know, growing population, get them into you know, some semblance of, uh, you know, national orientation uh, to understand that there's a connect between them and government, not just to allow them continue to grow like that uh, without having any connection to the country, not knowing what, you know, the flag is for or the country itself. How do we go about that? And that is under your purview. You know, the challenge of al Majiri has been a lingering issue in this country. And it's a sensitive issue. There's been several attempts by government to intervene in kind of structure. But because it seems to be a religious practice, you know, there are push factors and pull factors that sort of militate against the several attempts in the past that has been made to bring structure around that Almagiri uh, syndrome. Sister. Sister. Yes, and you would know that um, a lot of them are not even Nigerians. You know, there's fluidity in terms of movement across borders when it comes to this al uh, issue. And because these guys are placed under the supervision and purview of religious leaders, then it begins to look like, okay, it's an acceptable religious practice. But if you hear some Islamic scholars, they would say 
that this is not how it was planned to be. Even the learning conditions under which uh, those almajiris are being uh, uh, treated, it, it makes them to be vicious. You know, uh, sometimes the amalams are very, very uh, violent with them. You know, and these guys are exposed on the streets to all kind of conditions and so on. So, and then there's li very little of formal Western education being infused into that system. So what is needed at this point in time and what should we do? All right, let's quickly uh, take Shola Wahid in Elori. We've not been to Elori uh, all day. So let's know what's happening there. Shola Wahid, uh, it looks like as if you are in the stadium. Tell us where you are and uh, what's happening at this moment. Was, uh, I mean, is today like uh, yesterday? Shola, you are freezing. Perhaps we'll return to you once uh, your connection is better. Okay, so Shola Waid uh, is standing by, but uh, once he gets his, uh, um, once he gets his uh, equipment ready to go, we'll go. But let's go uh, to the south-south, uh, the riverine areas. Uh, Bayelsa State Governor Duye Diri has assured use of the state of continuous prioritization of their welfare and development. The governor, who was represented by his deputy, Lawrence Wujakbo, uh, said this when he received a coalition of Bayelsa youths on the solidarity work against violent protests in the state. Uh, Tinimipre Hohia uh, reports. Bayelsa State Governor Doye Diri has commended all service commanders for ensuring the state is peaceful called on Bayelsons to go about their legitimate businesses as he called on private sector players to invest in the state. On the nationwide end bad governance and hunger protests, the governor called on youth of the state not to embark on such exercise capable of jeopardizing the bridge of the peace in the state. The governor also appealed to youth to avoid being used by politicians who do not mean well for the state, while promising to dialogue with students and other youth bodies to ensure peace in the state. The governor called for the arrest of any other person parading himself as IYC president, apart from Sir Jonathan Lukobri. And let me sound this warning to all of those youths. The security in this state is ready for them. In another development, Governor Doye Dewey directs the immediate distribution of rice palliative from the federal government to rural communities in the state to ameliorate the economic hardship, emphasizing that no political appointee or civil servant should benefit from the 20 truck of 25 kg bags of rice. And as a leader that has the good of the people at heart, Governor Dewey says he will continue to ensure that the welfare of Bayelsans is his priority. In Yenogwa, Timinipri, or here, NTA News. You're still watching the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority, day two of the nationwide protest, the August protest. Uh, this is live, and uh, we've been to different parts of the country. We'll continue this conversation uh, after this short break. The government says protect and process over protest, while the protesters say the protest is for progress. We'll be back. All right, that uh, advert says uh, I'm a Nigerian. I am a Nigerian as well. I work even for the Nigerian Television Authority. So you're watching the, the NTA and it's in, in, you know the coverage of the uh, nationwide protest day two. Uh, not much of that has been seen. Coffee in many states, uh, a reduction in terms of the number.